is Ryan Miller, and for the past 15 years, I've helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. Do you ever get nervous or frustrated at the thought of raising capital from investors? Or maybe you wish you just had somebody to give you their playbook to discuss where to find it and how to accelerate your efforts in raising capital for your fund or your startup. Well, in this week's episode of Making Billions, I bring on my dear friend, Adam Jason. Adam is a recovering attorney who has launched his career in the startup realm. His efforts have yielded him $60 million in capital from over 400 investors. Raising capital while loving on your investors are all critical skills we need in our pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Adam Jason. Adam is a partner at Legacy Group. It's a $50 million investment firm that focuses on alternative investments within Latin American markets. So he's advised Fortune 500 companies and investment banks, including Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, to get through IPOs and offerings and debt and equity securities. Exceeding an aggregate, get a load of this, exceeding an aggregate of $10 billion. This guy knows what he's doing. So what this means is that Adam is highly skilled, not only at alternative investments, but in raising capital for nearly all deal types. So Adam, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one. I have the good fortune of doing a lot of these podcasts and you're working harder than anybody else, I think, for your audience to make it the most value we possibly could. So just wanted to give you a shout out and say, and say thank you for the good use of time that we've put in here. And I'm sure it'll be valuable to your audience. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to have you here. And so preparing for the show and, and just being prepared in general for something big and adding value to people around the world. That's what we do. I believe that's why we've risen to the top 2% in the world and we're continuing to upgrade. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about you. So thank you for that love. You're very kind. But I'm just curious. I mean, you know, you're, you're launching this fund. You've got a $50 million investment vehicle. Maybe walk us through, where did this begin for you? And, and how did you become an expert in this field? Sure. I guess I'll start from where I am now and, and walk backwards a little bit. So I'm talking to you today from Medellin, Colombia, South America. Uh, I've been down here for five years now. And as you mentioned, that's after a career of working at some of the top law firms in the US, really on behalf of Fortune 500 clients, Wall Street banks, uh, in the SEC world, corporate finance, advising boards of directors, really getting hands on with some of the top companies globally. You know, we've taken names that you would know public and, and done all of that. Like many people, I think probably listening to your show can relate to this. I got to the point in my career where I have to decide, do I become a partner at the law firm? Do I go in-house and work with a client or do I do something entrepreneurial? And it's probably not too hard to guess from the conversation that we're having and going to have that I took the third option. I have a pretty traditional path of college to postgrad to corporate America. And I found kind of the first time in my, in my life where I had the opportunity to do some traveling and, and explore. And I wanted to do something beyond going and seeing tourist locations, but actually go and live someplace and, and see what that would be like and go through the day to day, go to the supermarket, all the things that come with kind of a run of the mill, run of the mill lifestyle. So I found Medellin, Colombia. I heard great things. Saw a lot of money coming into the market, a lot of opportunities, particularly in real estate. I met my now business partner, uh, our founder at Legacy Group, which is our investment firm down here. From the States, I started helping with the initial capital raise for the Green Coffee Company, which is our flagship company within the Legacy Group portfolio. We found the business uh, and, and have you know really um, been super hands-on with that business all the way till now. So we raised $6 million in the initial raise. I helped from the US. We got that done. And then I just saw the opportunity to say, all right, this is my chance to do what I want to do and, and do it in a different place and kind of see the world a little bit. So January 2018, I moved down here full time. I'd slept on an air mattress for two weeks, sold all my things. I was on Craigslist and running to the supermarket across the street to offload you know, pots and pans or whatever <laughs> was in the house and uh, came down here 2018. And we've really hit the ground running since. So Green Coffee Company, we'll talk about it, I think more later. Uh, that's our that's our baby. That's the one we, we've we've grown up with. Uh, we started as basically a alternative to commercial real estate for investors comfortable with Columbia. And as we looked under the hood, we saw the opportunity to to make it the largest coffee company, largest producer of coffee in all of Colombia. And I'm proud to say we've done that over the course of the last five years. We've brought in about sixty million dollars into Colombia. And our client base is really probably about 95% US investors, all accredited investors, folks who are looking for opportunities outside of the US, but want to be involved in big, big opportunities. And, you know, coffee, Colombia, they're kind of synonymous and, and we're building something that really has potential to make people a lot of money and, and be involved in something pretty cool along with the rest of our portfolio. But that's kind of how I got to 
this conversation with you today. So that's awesome. So Legacy Group and Green Coffee Company, that was uh, sounds like your maiden voyage, not in your career, but from uh, this current firm. Maybe you can walk us through a little bit about like that first investment. What is it? What does that do? Maybe walk us through a little bit of that and, and give people a little bit of a taste on uh, what it's like to, to just pursue your, your first investment. Sure. So Green Coffee Company was really an idea of our investors. We, we When I came to Columbia, we had an investor base that was already focused on commercial real estate and basically told us they wanted an alternative, but something that fu- functioned similarly. So what do I mean by that? Something that's heavy assets, collateralized, cash flowing, the investors that like you know to be invested in, in hard assets. So we really set up the business as a consolidation of farms, get it cash flowing, put some infrastructure around it, and let's treat it as a alternative asset management project. Or It really was a project at the time rather than a business to commercial real estate. As we looked harder at the business and got more familiar with the industry, what we saw was highly fragmented. We got about 95% of all the farmers in the country own less than three acres, a shortage of capital. You know, if you have three acres, you're not doing a 506C raise from, from US investors. Uh, and, and a chance to really, I'd say, springboard the industry as a whole through new technology, new talent, international eyes, everything that we saw there. So the shift, the shift went from creating an asset management product to create an enterprise that we can get to an exit to somebody like a Starbucks or Nestle or take it to a US exchange. So I'd be lying if I told you, you know, we had everything sketched out from from the from the beginning, but we've really grown with the opportunities. We're fortunate to have a great investor base who supports us and is equally as excited, I think, about what they're what they're seeing us do. And that's led to market reputation. You know, we get more opportunities pitched to us than than ever before. It's just the nature of of being around, being on the ground here. Uh, building a good reputation and I guess having capital that is meaningful. Awesome. And so you've grown it to, I think you have about 60-ish million uh, That's right. raised and put into that into this company. So you've grown, you've grown this green coffee company to huge and impressive sizes. Now, I'm wondering if you could just share with us about three or four things that you found to be helpful in the pursuit of Legacy Group, your first maiden voyage, your deal raising 60 billion. I mean, you've been doing a lot and and that's not even to speak about your former life as a, we'll say you're a recovering attorney, uh, your former life doing that and $10 billion in deals. I mean, you've done a lot. You've got your mountain of wisdom. So our fans around the world, we're in about 100 countries around the world. I'm wondering if you would be able to share with them about three or four different tips that you've learned along the way in your journey to just help people who are in that similar situation on making billions. Sure. I mean, it is, I guess there's, there's a couple of ways to look at it. If you're on the investor side, I'd say the opportunity is looking behind your own borders and finding opportunities elsewhere. You know, we can, we can talk about some specifics, but like you and I chatted the other day, huge opportunities of just in, in foreign currency arbitrage these days, if you're looking at the dollar versus some of the other currencies globally, where you're literally making money if, if currencies are just regulating back to what they were eight months ago. If you're on the capital raising side, I think, you know, we, we have our list of specifics that we'll get into and, and how to go about it. For us, it, it was important as being in a different country than most of our investors are typically used to creating an opportunity that was big enough to make them comfortable or make them willing to take the jump from investing in commercial real estate in Austin or Fort Lauderdale to say, oh, I'm going to put some money into Columbia. So part of the strategy has always been, you know, we're not doing Colombian bananas because nobody's ever heard of it. But anybody who drinks coffee knows Colombian coffee. And if you can get to number one in the country, you know, that's meaningful and that's something that people want to be a part of. So we're fortunate to have done that. So I think advice for business builders is thinking big and, and knowing what your what your audience is, is likely to look like and what they're going to demand of you from a, a risk perspective. Yeah, I love it. And you know, you mentioned before that when you started, it was like a one to three thousand uh, Colombian pesos, and it's since uh, gone to one in four thousand, I think, roughly. How does that affect the uh, the bottom line? I, I think it's it's one of those kind of hidden opportunities in investing landscape right now. Uh, we just wrote an article about this topic for for Nasdaq. Basically, the market factors we're looking at right now are a historically strong dollar, overpriced investment opportunities in the U.S., decreasing prices for assets and businesses abroad. Why debt's becoming harder to come by and way more expensive. Foreign markets essentially are tied to the Fed. Fed raises rates. Banks internationally get more conservative and notch up their, their rates as well. If you can't get debt, everybody, the only buyers are ones who can pay cash. So prices are coming, coming down naturally. Also, of course, leading to decreased competition for foreign assets and businesses. 
So investors who are looking for I don't know, a vacation home or they're looking to do something bigger, like buy some businesses or invest in more meaningful or substantial projects, I should say, outside of their home country, you know, the dollar right now against the euro, the yen, Eastern European countries, Latin America, it's the strongest has been since the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s. So what are we seeing in Colombia, just to kind of put a pin on this? Eight months ago, one dollar was equal to about 3,700 pesos. Today, it's closer to 5,000. Everybody's expecting is kind of markets settle a little bit, we get more back on the on the bullish side versus where we are now, that that currency is likely to regulate. It's basically hovered around 3,000 to one for as long as I've been in Colombia and, and prior to that. So you know, you're looking at a 35% potential gain just by just by the foreign currency movement. So I think if somebody's looking at an investment in euro denominations or in Mexico, it's it's worthwhile to take a look at what's going on with the currency market. And, and maybe there's an opportunity there where you're not even counting just appreciation and cash flow. You got that benefit of a, a foreign currency play or foreign currency arbitrage that could really do something meaningful for you as well. That we're buying prices, we're buying farms now for less than the same price they were in 2017 because we're paying in dollars instead of instead of pesos. So it's 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 kind of crazy, <laughs> right? So so there are benefits to doing uh, international investment, whether it's emerging markets or other markets. I think we're saying that with different currencies, that certainly can come in handy. So keep an eye out when you're doing alternative investments or really any investment. Is what direction do I foresee the foreign currency? And that if you're right you can actually start to get a little extra cream on the top. That's that's brilliant advice. And, you know, I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, what has been, um, you know, the comparison of the, let's say, traditional public equities markets, we'll say stock market versus alternatives. I mean, how have those compared and, and what are you seeing right now? I think there's an opportunity in alternative investments, investing in private businesses, investing in businesses that are international in nature that most high net worth investors, accredited investors, are not really taking advantage of to the full extent. I think this, the statistic that I last saw was from the study from McKinsey was 2% of high net worth investor portfolios are allocated to alternatives. Institutions like pension funds, private equity, the, the 30 to 50% of their assets are, are allocated to alternatives. So I can't say that you know one is... Um, going to be right all, all the time but historically private private equity private markets private businesses outperform public markets and of course uh real I'd say real estate but other assets that don't have as much growth potential it's it's unlikely that you know you buy a house in name your market that it's going to 5x maybe at 2x's but you know the statistics you see is basically if if public markets are heading in, in a bullish direction private equity outperforms almost always by a couple of percentage points. If public markets are going down, you get even a, a, a bigger spread, 6 to 8% is kind of the statistics that we've, we've most recently looked at and seen. So it's an opportunity I think more and more investors should be looking at, adding to their portfolio. Of course, they have to do their diligence, You know, the currency arbitrage we talked about, or looking at alternatives. Do it in markets that you know and are familiar with and people that you, you trust to manage your money if you're not doing it directly. But you know, it's, it's a big... It's a big opportunity out there. And I think it just takes a little bit of looking, seeing the data and, and a little bit of push to, to do it. Man. So investing in private deals versus public equities, as long as you meet the criteria. Uh, did I hear you say historically they've outperformed uh, the private markets, uh, which is all what this show is about, making billions. So it doesn't yeah. help if you're making... Is that right? Did I get that right? We're making 6 to 8% above traditional investments depends on where the public yeah. stocks are uh, but average. yeah it, uh, it's it's an outperforming asset wow yeah that's phenomenal you and i both know that and here we are uh, as the heralds singing the the song uh to the world to say hey private investments private equity venture capital heck even real estate i mean whatever doing these private deals tends to generate a lot of alpha or outperforming the market so that is brilliant you know when uh, you've certainly raised uh your fair share of capital and and have had uh, the joy of doing all that when it comes to raising capital, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you found. Maybe you can share with our listeners around the world. What are some of the do's and don'ts that you found from your extensive experience in raising capital and, and dealing in high finance? It's an interesting dynamic because I've done it for Fortune 500s who can raise $500 million overnight because Morgan Stanley calls some of their, their client list and it's, and it's a done deal. But what we've shifted our focus to is really working with high net worth accredited investors in the US. So the question becomes, how do you find them and how do you make the appropriate impression on them that they're willing to, to trust you with their capital and they're excited enough about your, your business. So concretely, I can tell you some of the mistakes that we've made and, and that I would advise against. And, and I caveat this with saying, you know, our raises, we, we typically are, are raising $100,000 minimums. 
So just by its very nature, the size of the, the ask, it, it's very, it can be very hands-on, but it's great. It's an opportunity to build trust. Uh, but we've we've definitely made some mistakes along the way with different avenues that we've tried. You know, we spent an unfortunate amount of money on things like LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads. And really what we found was it's great if you're asking for $500 and you're doing a crowdfunding or something along those lines. But when you're asking people for the kind of capital that we're talking about, they want to meet you. They want to see you. They at least want to hear you through channels such as this and understand the other person. They're not going to invest that kind of money through because they saw an ad on, on Facebook, at least at scale has been our experience. There's a lot of agencies out there that will promise you big things. They can get you all these leads. You never know the quality of the leads. You may get a ton, but you have to screen the quality. It's just been our experience that there's a lot better ways to get in front of the right people if that's the kind of audience you're trying to work with. We've also made mistakes with respect to trying to engage broker dealers. You know, Very common to say, okay, well, this person has a network of investors or family offices, these kind of things. And, and you know, everybody promises a lot. They ask for upfront commissions. My experience has been, and we've, we've been through, through this a few times. Um, and I know it from my, from my days you know, at the law firm too. Everybody promises big, but their network is only, is only uh, so big. And, and they're never going to care about your business and be able to tell the story with the same enthusiasm that you are. So maybe you find one that gives you 10 introductions, you're still going to end up doing all the work and having all the conversations anyways. It usually doesn't go well. And there's no way that it's, it's a, they're a commodity, really. It's like, who's better than one or the other? You know, unless you're working with Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, which they're not going to do for the size of kind of capital we're talking about here, they're, they're all the same. So I think there's better uses of, of funds. Um, some other kind of things we've learned from and advise staying away from would be, especially for, for the capital, again, that we're talking about, you know, certain funding platforms, like if you look at like the uh, crowd engines, republics, there's, there's a lot of them now. I think, again, if you're looking for $500 checks, maybe it's good, but you're going to be constrained in probably how much you raise. If you're looking for 100000 people don't just really go to a website, see a, a faceplate or a tombstone advertisement and say, all right, you know, I'm in. It sounds great, but it's, it's a little bit of a false, false promise. And then the last one I was going to bring up, you know, we've, we've, we've made our strategy basically exclusive with uh, individual investors, high net worth, as I mentioned. We've decided to stay away from, from funds and family offices for, for a variety of reasons. You know, funds really come in. They want to, we've gotten term sheets. They want to take over the board of directors. They want to undercut your valuation sometimes in half or more. Uh, it's tough to, I'd say, and if you can find one, amazing. You know, I, I know, Ryan, you're, you're working a fund and, and I'm sure you're you're not one of the people I'm talking about. But you know, you yeah, really need somebody I'm, I'm who's one of a the partner. good ones. You're one of the good <laughs> ones. You really need a you really need a partner. You know, yeah, it's it's um it's not somebody who you know you should be working with if they're looking for an investment arbitrage or whatever. You know, we get a lot of we we have these conversations a lot and we're not gonna allow somebody who's never been to Colombia to basically take control of a Colombian operation. That we're running down here, and then you know we basically turn our investors over to them. It's just not something we're we're wanting to do. And they also move really slow. I love the investors we have because you know they'll, they'll make decisions quickly. They're usually entrepreneurs, business owners, ready to get back to work and, and looking for some exciting opportunities. Of course, they do their diligence, but it's not the risk averse nature like we see with most funds or even family offices, which are really in that kind of wealth preservation mode. I think very few of them are willing to, to make a leap. So those are just some of the things that if somebody's thinking about raising capital or going out for more capital, I'm sure there's a lot of people who have gone through this before. Just wanted to share some of our things that we, that we don't like um, or, or don't pursue uh, to, to try, hopefully, hopefully save some time. Yeah, I love that. So to synthesize, so running ads that wasn't really that great for you on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, et cetera. Like no. if you're trying to get big tickets, don't run ads on Facebook. The other one is broker dealers. Um, they wanted upfront fees. You mentioned they're. I mean, they're okay. They're there, but don't rely on them. Um, according to your your experience, um, they they can be a little bit pricey. And, and then third was funding platforms. Again, it's kind of small ticket items. So if you're just tiny, you're trying to raise a couple hundred, a couple thousand, fine. If you're trying to raise sixty million or six hundred million, probably not the place for you. And then again, funds and family offices. That probably wasn't the best uh, for you. Just because they're professional investors, maybe a little too professional, <laughs> cutting your valuation so they get a better Sharks. position. Yeah, I, I know. I know the game. Yeah. Um, okay, so so those are some of the things that you're saying. You know what? Maybe if you're starting out, that might not be the I ideal place to begin. So let's flip it on its head. What are some of the things that you found helpful? Some of the do's uh, when raising capital. Yeah. In preparation of our call, I made a list here. So I'll just go through them one by one and try and give specific examples so that if anybody out there wants to also kind of piggyback on what we've done and the relationships that we've 
discovered to be valuable, you know, I want to make those kind of uh, put them on their radar as well. So, you know, the first one, of course, and if for first time investors or first time um, capital raisers, et cetera, it's not as, as applicable, but, you know, our, our existing investors are our biggest fans because we take care of those relationships, communication, how having them down to Columbia to see the operations, to meet the team, webinars quarterly and annually, weekly emails. You know, people are big fans of us. I think, I think it's the overwhelming feedback we get from everybody is they, they like what we're doing because they, can, they get an inside look into the business and they feel comfortable because of the communication. So for anybody out there who has investors, don't sacrifice on the communication. Even if somebody doesn't respond or say anything, our experience has always been that it's highly appreciated. That's led to number two on the list for us, which has been you know a big wave of referrals, largely because of what I, I just mentioned. So I, I won't beat that up too much, but take care of the people who believe in you and they want to they want to talk about it. Um, we've over the years built a database through you know things like we're doing with writing for Nasdaq or content that we put out. And like I said, it's like LinkedIn and Facebook. Don't expect automatic conversions, but you know if, if you're adding value through, we, we primarily focus on LinkedIn because it's more professional. You know, we built a database over the years, and and honestly, um, maybe it's discouraging at the outset, but you know, we've had people who have been watching us since day one, and maybe just last year decided to make an investment with us. So, giving people good information, again, showing them that you know what you're talking about, that you're building a business that they would they should be wanting to be involved in, critical. Out the gate, and really into, um, I'd say probably to the point where we got to like 20, 20 million of capital. A big source for us was friends and family. You know, they, they know you, they know if, they, if you're credible, they <laughs> probably grew up with you. So, so that's a good first kind of outlet. You know, so we work with a lot of masterminds and investor groups. One that I joined early on, frankly, for business purposes, but also personal, personal development and kind of all that the group comes with is a, a group called GoBundance. GoBundance really focuses on six pillars related to health, contribution, uh, fi- financial, growing businesses, et cetera. But what we found there was a lot of people looking for, call it passive investment opportunities, mostly entrepreneurs, business owners, they're comfortable with, call it, you know, taking risk and doing something outside the mainstream. Uh, it's a fantastic group. We, today we have, I think over, I know over 100, I think probably about 120 investors from that group alone, you know, well into the, uh, well into the eight figures of, of capital that we've raised just from that group. So anyway, listening, who's you know, looking for business opportunities, but also kind of a, a personal development group as well. That one's fantastic. We also work with, as I mentioned, several other masterminds, investor groups. If somebody listens to Justin Donald on the Lifestyle Investor, that one's amazing. We've presented to their group before. Uh, another group that we started recently working with, it's called Infinite Freedom. Uh, that one's really focused on, on, on doctors. And then another one that we found to be fantastic is the Rich Life Mastermind. I'm giving you these names because there's a lot of them out there and some of them are tough to access. But also they're tough to find. A lot of times it's like the GoBundance is an exception because it has about 850 members, but sometimes it's 15 people who like each other and invest in deals together. So it's, it's not always readily accessible through a Google search. Podcasts have been, have been fantastic for us. You know, they really are a good opportunity to get your voice out there. Uh, and, and tell your story. You know the, the people who what I've seen is the people who are into investing and learning and growth, that's, that's a big segment of the podcast listening population and you know it's a testament to kind of what we're doing here today we found it most valuable to hire an agency we use outlier audio uh, and they find us you know fantastic podcasts to participate uh, to participate with and, and get interviewed on so if somebody's looking for a podcast uh, you know agency that can help them uh, that, that's that's a good one I, I, I should say I don't have any uh, stake in this either I'm just giving you recommendations based on pleasant experiences and also working with ones that uh, we decided to stay away from. We do number eight on the list. We, we would do a lot of work with investment clubs. These would be more like paid presentations. So just this week, um, our investor relations team is doing a presentation with a group called Money Show. And then another one with AltsDB, uh, which is now um, kind of merged with Wealth Channel. So if you search either of those, you'll be able to find them. We also do a lot of work with a group called Left Field Investors. Uh, we've run some ads with them, which have been great for lead flow, done the podcast. So some of these more paid opportunities. They can be a little bit expensive, honestly. So you know, they're they're really something. I call it ten grand for ten grand for uh, a presentation opportunity. But for us, it always is, is always worthwhile. But if you're raising you know a small amount of money, it's probably not the right the right channel. Probably won't get past the friends and family if it's under a couple hundred thousand. Hopefully. So another one that we've we've had a lot of success with is, and we really uh, this kind of just hit us in the head. It should have it should have been earlier. 
but we do a lot of presentations to self-directed IRA companies. What we saw was a lot of our investors, they want to invest through their self-directed IRAs. So if somebody's not familiar with this, usually they have a self-directed IRA provider. And we saw the same names coming up over and over, Entrust, Camaplan. And we said, you know what, why don't we talk to the actual managers of these self-directeds and see if we can just pre- present to their investors because they have, you know, all these people are already holding their self-directeds with them. Uh, so that's been, that's, been, that's been a good one for us. Again, those names are Rocket Dollar, Entrust, Camaplan. Those probably have been the three biggest ones for us. And then it always gets our investors and new people excited, although I, I think it's, it's not as scalable as I would like it to be. You know, we do host a lot of visits, organize events down here in Colombia so people can see the country, see the operations, meet the team. And it's always, it's always fun to kind of meet and learn from, from new people who are most often doing some interesting things. You know, the, the accredited guys got there for a reason. It's usually because they're doing something pretty exciting. Uh, and the last one that I think we've had some, some good results from are really striking partnerships with other people who have broad networks. We kind of always try to work through, call it centers of influence. And there's some people who want to partner along with us. This one I think is, is worth noting. It's, it's important to not be paying commissions and performance-based compensation to partners. Otherwise, you run into US broker-dealer rules. So you're basically putting not only the fundraise in jeopardy, but the business as a whole in jeopardy if you're paying those commissions to people who aren't licensed broker dealers. So it's not unlikely that you get a knock from the from the SEC, especially if something goes wrong and people are looking to get their their money back. It can destroy kind of the whole offering. So what we do, maybe this is a helpful a helpful tip for people. The way we usually do the partnerships when we when we raise money when we when we were just a thesis and a and a blueprint versus what we're doing now. Uh, and let's say for example, you know, somebody if you put in five hundred thousand dollars, you know, you get a seven and a half percent discount on the, on the share price. So we'll have a share price set for the round, which is correlated to the value of the company. What we tell the partners is tell your audience that this opportunity exists and disclose to them that if they invest, they're agreeing that they're essentially going to gift you a portion of the discount that they get. So it would be common say, all right, we have a 7.5% discount. I agree that I'm going to give the person who introduced me to this 2.5% of the discount that I got. It, it avoids that broker dealer issue because it's really a agreement between two outside people versus the company and the person who's you know acting as a, a broker if, you know to, without a, a better word there so that's what you want to stay away from but if people are doing it on a private basis and it's disclosed you know, I think the guidance is pretty good that that that's that's okay but you got to be careful if, if you're just paying people because you know they raise a million bucks they get X if they raise two million they get y it's you're setting yourself up for trouble man that's that's brilliant and you know, I'm curious. So what an amazing list. Thank you for that. And going through that's the list. Yeah, that is a phenomenal <laughs> list with uh I mean, you have partnerships. You you also said here's a couple things that probably will waste your time and then just getting referrals, masterminds, going on podcasts, all of those things are, are very helpful. Now when when you have investors and you've brought in a few, I think you mentioned you had about four hundred investors right now. Yeah, we're so, at about four thirty. Yeah. Wow. So great work to you, brother. So um, thank you. Having 400 investors, I mean, what have you found as far as investor relations goes? I mean, what maybe walk through some of our fans in the world. Um, how is managing 400 investors? I mean, how do you see investor relations? It's, to me, it almost strikes me as odd sometimes how often we get the question. But one of the questions we get, and I assume it's because people have had bad experiences in the past, is how often am I going to hear from you? And my response is probably to an obnoxious extent. We show people that we're really sharing information and inviting questions making ourselves available. It all sounds obvious, but given the number of times I get this question, it seems like some people don't take it as seriously as they should. So we've, we've hit it a couple of times on the interview here, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. And you know, this is if you have a fund and you're working with investors, or if you're a founder and you have investors who have given you capital, you know, the relationship doesn't end once they've given you money. It's really just beginning. So I'd say take care of those people and, and the results can really compound because if they love you, they're telling other people about it. Awesome. I love that. So as we wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like our fans around the world to know? Sure. So for, for folks who are interested in what we're doing down here in Colombia, if you like what you hear uh, with respect to the Green Coffee Company, we're wrapping up our Series C funding round for the business. We started at $25 million. We've got a few million, few million still on the table for accredited investors who are looking to participate. $100,000 minimums. It's a US-based investment. It's headquarter, the company's headquartered in the US with the operations here in Colombia. So everything's done through the US from an investment standpoint, banking perspective, everything. And our goal is a sale or IPO of the business in, in 2026. And we're looking at meaningful returns on capital. You know, the numbers tell us we can get to 11x 
capital that's coming in in this current round. So definitely reach out to to me if you want to participate. We'd love to get folks from this show you know, following along and, and being great investors. Awesome. And how uh, is there a, a way that you prefer to be contacted for people that just want to learn more? I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You just search Adam Jason Legacy Group. You'll, you'll find me there and, and I'm open to you know, direct email. So my email is adam.j at legacy-group.co. .co, CO. Awesome. I love that. So as we wrap things up, just to synthesize everything that me and Adam have talked about, look to foreign investments, the foreign exchange forecast when investing overseas. The other thing that we talked about, the important gifts that Adam's given us is focus on private investments. If you're chasing and hunting alpha, private investments do have a historical track record at outperforming public equities, right? Obviously, this is not financial advice. Don't listen to me. We, right, we don't know what we're doing. We're going to disclaim everything. So you're your uh, lawyer side will be very happy with that. But, um, you know, it's important to look at, at alternative sources. So we literally call these alternatives and, you know, also raise capital using that list. I'm not going to regurgitate the list, but um, there's an extensive list that you can review on this show. There's effective ways and there's less effective ways to do that. And then finally, once you have those investors in the door, do your work, make sure that you take good care of them, make sure that you support them, they hear from you. And doing these things will give you the skills that you need in your pursuit of making billions. Wow, what a show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.